Greetings. My name is Guy Dancy and I'm the president of the Yellow Point Ecological Society and this is a, a joint presentation from the Yellow Point Ecological Society and the Coxilo Watershed Group. So I'm going to, um, before I introduce Heather, um, I'm going to do a brief summary of what we've been up to in the Yellow Point Ecological Society so that you get a sense of what we're doing and then Heather will do a much longer presentation on what they're doing down in Coxsila. So we're from the north end of the CVRD to the south end having this meeting together. <laughs> um, so there we go. So as the Yellow Point Ecological Society, we were founded in 2017, or no, that's 2018, we work to appreciate, protect and restore nature in Yellow Point. We love everything about the forest up here. We really, that's what it's all about. We do a whole host of things, starting with the smaller ones. We do broom busting on Yellow Point Road. We do pulling ivy in Hema Park. We do more broom busting and we have fun with our graphics, right? We've set up a, a roadside trash challenge to do the very small stuff of keeping our roads clear of all the cans and bottles. We hosted an eco film festival a couple of years ago. We have a, a website with a lot of stuff, including a, a unique website that records the sound of all the birds. And let me see if I can just press on this and see if it works to show you how this works. We get 20,000 hits a year on this website. And so here's the American Robin. There you go. <laughs> um, we put together a, a five minute video on our, our love for the forest and the different ways of saving the forest about a year ago, which you can find on YouTube. We, held, we hosted a, a, a nature photo contest this year, which um, some incredibly beautiful um, people have entered um, looking east. Um, yeah. And our winning photo, um, which is a salmon fly Sichada on Oregon grape flowers. We are trying to form a Yellow Point trail, a multi purpose trail around Yellow Point um, to sort of give us safety from the speeding cars. And we, you, we had a unique system of, of hanging painted yellow bikes all around the neighborhood, which got everyone talking and really understanding what we were doing. We've hosted a whole bunch of community meetings over the last two, three years with Geraldine Manson, with Bruce Whittington, and you'll know a lot of these people, Ted Leishner. Janet Lockheed. Um, we did an evening, a day of poetry in the forest. It was a hike when we stopped to read poetry about the forest. <laughs> Eric Piquila, Piquila on the forestry. Um, Richard Hill from Yellow Point Lodge. My wife, Carolyn Herriot on seed saving. Um, Genevieve Singleton. Priscilla Brewer. Jane Alcott White. Elka Wind. Galen Armstrong. Nancy Turner. Brani Penn, and just a couple of weeks ago, um, Claudia Copley. In the beginning of May, we're doing our first BioBlitz, um, which is a new thing to us. And we're putting together a handbook, a, a book called The Love of Nature, the Yellow Point and Cedar Landowners Handbook, which is a big assembly of thoughts. We hope that every landowner will be able to have a copy to inspire them and to look after their land. That's one of the sample pages inside it. So, Coming to the forestry issue, I mean, we are quite well forested with forest that was all cleared around in the 1930s or 40s, so it's now 60 to 70 to 80 years old. It's all coastal Douglas fir, um, and it's threatened by logging and development. In 2018, this 60 acre parcel of forest, was, which had been undisturbed for 80 years, was sold to a numbered company. Here's a sense of what we were fighting to present, to protect. Um, we tried to save it and we failed. The property was clear cut from corner to corner. Um, one fella buncher came in in three weeks, took down the entire 60 acres. That's what it looks like today or soon after they cut it all. This is the possible fate of all our local forests. Only the riparian zones have any protection. The rest of the forest we discovered has been ecologically abandoned. It has zero legal protection unless it's in a riparian zone, a very narrow strip. But even then you can strip it to the ground and pay very minimal fines. So it's what we call dystopia, the miserable state of a clear-cut forest. So how can we protect our forests and watersheds? We are part of the uh, Coastal Douglas Fir 
biogeoclimatic zone, whereas you down in Coxsila are the um, coastal western hemlock zone, I believe. So all of the dark green um, there is in the, with, it's the coastal Douglas fir, which is a, full of a, a rare and endangered species. So ecotopia is the natural state of an undisturbed forest. Protectopia is one of our solutions, the permanent protection of a forest as parkland. And hopefully the CVRD would establish a regional conservation fund similar to the one that CRD has established to enable it to buy more land when it came up in need of protection. We've also been floating the idea of a coastal Douglas fir land reserve, similar to the agricultural land reserve, which would not apply to crown land and not apply to private managed forest land, but it would apply to private land. It would allow development, but to be required to be clustered in smaller lots. And it would also allow logging, but only using ecoforestry methods of logging. Then there's covenantopia, which is the permanent protection of a forest by means of a conservation covenant placed on the land by its owner. This is quite expensive, can cost up to 25,000 for an individual owner. So we're, we're interested in the idea of a community conservation covenants when adjacent landowners would share the cost. We haven't done any work towards that yet. We're also interested in the potential for conservation property tax incentives, which they have on the Gulf Islands, but not in the CVRD. So similar to the, the agricultural um, tax incentives. Forestopia is the clustering of permitted homes within a forest, enabling the rest of the forest to be protected. So if you cluster developments, instead of 20 acres being divided up into four or five acre lots, you know, you might have four one acre lots and a huge and sort of, you know, 16 acres of shared parkland. And then there's potentially density transfer. So if you get reduced density by three lots down in Cedar, you can transfer it up to Lanceville where they want to do more development or into, you know, and that's within the, that would be within the regional district of Nanaimo who have this as a legal system you can do. Then there's ecoforestopia, the happy state of a forest being managed using the ecological principles of ecoforestry, which are demonstrated in practice at Wildwood, just up the road from us. Then there's regulatopia, which is the protection of a forest by provincial and local regulation to end clear cutting, require ecoforestry methods of logging and require the clustering of permitted homes. And that leads us to the question of what we could, what could be written into a green OCP and the CVRD is, is starting on the process of the modernized OCP this year. So this is the time for us to write the clauses in the OCP, which is the foundation for development permit area, a unique environmental DPA to protect the forest. That's a, that's a controversial issue, but we need to lay the foundations in the OCP. Finally, democ democratopia is the practice of democracy to empower citizens, elected councils and regional directors to share in the management of local forests and not hand the whole thing over entirely to either forest companies as in the private managed forest lands or simply to forest private owners to um, do what they want. So we've done our, we, we, we share in protests whenever we can. And then there's utopia, the state of being a champion for the forest. Um, that's our little ending thing. And uh, well, with that, I'm going to hand over to, no, not hand over, I'm going to introduce Claudia. So I'll stop sharing and I'll shut this down and go to, so the Coxsila Working Group is a group of community volunteers who address concerns about the impact of land use and climate change on their local water and environment. It was established in 2015 by the Couch and Station Area Association, which brings neighbors together to promote, the, to promote the livability and sustain the natural environment and the historic and cultural values of the Couch and Station area. Heather Pritchard, is a professional forester with 30 years experience working in the natural resource sector, including for a woodlot, a community forest, and a demonstration forest in the West Kootenays that practices ecosystem-based forestry to protect local water sources. She's also worked for the provincial government on riparian and species at risk policy. Since moving to the Couch and Valley seven years ago, she's been inspired by the hard work performed by local communities and NGOs, and has joined the challenge of finding ways to protect and restore local ecosystems. Heather, the digital floor is all yours. Excellent, thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here today and, and very, very much a pleasure. Uh, I see there's a, a few people that have come tonight that were part of my presentation on uh, Monday for the Land Trust. And now I'm embarrassed that I'm reusing a few of the slides. So, <laughs> but uh, we'll just get going here. As, as Guy mentioned in the introduction there, um, the people of Couch and Station a few years ago just started wondering, well, what's the shape of our watershed? What, 
you know, is what, what's going on in those higher elevations that we can't get to because of all the gates? What is the condition? What is the health? So they're inspired by a neighboring community of Lake um, Shawnigan Lake and decided, well, they have this wonderful ecosystem-based assessment that showed them more detail about what their watershed is all about. And, you know, let's do some money raising and, and do one ourselves. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about this evening. And uh, normally this would be, this is a lot of information tonight. I hope I have picked all the, the right bits. There's, I'm going to be sharing with you information that comes out of actually two parts of this project. There's actually two reports. And the first part of the project talks about uh, the character and condition of the Coxsila watershed. And what that means is we first did our research to figure out what was the watershed like before the European settlers arrived? What was it like prior to 160 years ago? And for me, this was a really inspiring part of the project. As, as Guy mentioned, I've been here only seven years. So this was, the opportunity for me to dive deep and learn about the local ecosystems in general. So after then describing the local condition, what were forests, what did they used to be like, then we started to take a look at what condition the forests are at right now. So what were they like in the past? What are they like now? So that's part one of the project and part one of my presentation this evening. And then we'll dive into part two of the project which takes everything we learned in part one and builds what we call a protected landscape network. Now, what's important to remember before we go too far down the path here is that this work uh, has absolutely no um, legal authority whatsoever. Uh, but what it's intended to be is a conversational piece for the community to work with, have conversations with other landowners and start to find solutions to some of the problems within the watershed. So now I will start the presentation. And here we go. So yes, I uh, forgot to mention that my partner in crime in this project was Emily Doyle Yamaguchi. She's uh, currently a student at UBC working on her master's. So she is not with us here this evening, but uh, she was a, we did this project together and she was a very important part of this project. So here we go, part one of the project talking about character and condition and one of the fun things that I learned about or really interesting things I learned in starting this project is how important the Coxsila watershed is to the uh, local First Nations people. And in fact, with uh, Cowichan tribes, it is the place where their creation story begins. And this carved mask here is of Silutska. And he was the first Cowichan person to arrive in the valley actually fell onto Coxsila Ridge, fell from the sky. So the place has very, you know, not only is it ecologically extremely valuable and important, but it's also a great place in terms of cultural history and richness. So this is uh, the ancient forest in, uh, in the Coxsila watershed. And as Guy mentioned, uh, a good chunk of our watershed is in the coastal western hemlock ecosystem type. There is a little bit of the coastal Douglas fir at the very bottom, but what's really uh, different about the watershed then versus now is that in the past, about 80% of the watershed um, or of the coastal western hemlock forests in the watershed would have been old growth forests. So in the past, uh, fire was extremely infrequent and wind on this side of the island is not near as intense as on the western side. So forests tended to get old and trees were often 450, 500 years old or that's how old they were on average and on the drier slopes closer to 350 years. And then in the deeper, uh, in the, on the more moist, type of sites like the riparian areas, the north facing slopes, there you would find forests over a thousand years old. So the forests were very old and extremely diverse in terms of structure. 
There, of course, were the big trees that we all love to walk through, but there were also small trees, deciduous trees, and a tremendous amount of diversity in terms of wildlife and invertebrates. And this is, uh, again, as people who have heard me talk before, I just am so inspired by the dead wood within a forest. I, I get so excited when I see the dead trees laying on the ground or the dead trees standing. Other people feel sad because the tree has died, but I just see just this amazingly important piece of biodiversity and structure. And uh, what was interesting about these older forests is that about a third of the volume within them, a third of the biomass was dead wood. And that dead wood was extremely important in terms of providing wildlife habitat and, and very important in terms of holding water on the site. And with all the fungi and the insects and the uh, reptiles, amphibians living in that dead wood, all, that, uh, all those organisms, they create, um, uh, or they end up, ugh, let me try that again, <laughs> they end up creating uh, a, a feature in the landscape where this dead wood actually has more life in it, more living biomass than the standing green tree right beside it. And, and again, that in that upper left corner there, the tree here laying on the ground, this dead tree here will, can hold 25 times more moisture than the mineral soil that it is lying on. And this is extremely important when we get into the dry summer months in terms of releasing water into the soil to keep the plants around it alive and, and also keeping all the organisms in the soil alive as well. So dead wood is extremely important. Deadwood is also important for the wildlife. And in fact, a quarter of all the wildlife species in our local forests here, they need these dead trees, whether it is for nesting in, feeding, roosting. And my favorite ecosystem type within the forest is the riparian. And back before the European settlement era began, Riparian forests were full of these large trees and they were extremely diverse. This is where diversity is at the greatest. And a lot of deciduous forests as well, tremendous depths of organic matter, very deep organic soils. And these are riparian forests were very important as they're used by very many wildlife species and probably half of all the wildlife species in the local area. One of the things that's different about the Coxsila watershed versus the Cowichan, which is right beside it, is that it doesn't have a large lake. Uh, the one photograph is of Grant Lake, that is the largest lake within the watershed, and it's one of five small lakes. This one is about 28 hectares, whereas the other ones are only about five hectares or so. So there isn't a lot of, in terms of features, holding water on the site. So in the winter, when a big storm would hit, uh, you know, there would be a lot of flow into the river and then in the summer uh, when it is dry and it is not raining, then the, then the river would also, um, uh, would also run much lower. So it was a very naturally flashy system, uh, though in current days it is much more flashy than it used to be, but all, all, over all time it was a very flashy system. Wetlands are one of the more important features within the watershed for storing water in that uh, there are so few lakes, whereas there are, especially at the higher elevations, quite an elaborate network of wetlands. So summing up some of the things we learned about the watershed and its condition before European settlers arrived, this is looking at what is the terrain like? And what this map shows, this is one of the many maps that were produced within the project, is there's not a lot of really steep slopes. There's a few of these red areas, but overall the slopes of the Coxsila watershed are fairly gentle. The red areas are over 60%, which is, which is fairly steep. In the lower elevations, there are some high and moderately vulnerable watersheds, or aquifers, pardon me, and there's these uh, brighter pink 
polygons as well. And those are potential karst formations. Uh, we don't know for sure that there is karst there, but some preliminary studies indicate there might be. And these features are really important because they're a whole underground network of water systems and the water there tends to remain cold year round. So in the summertime, it can provide cold water into the streams, which is very important for the fish in terms of keeping their habitat the way they like it. One thing I'd like to mention as well is that this whole project was done using uh, publicly available data. Uh, in a moment here, you'll see that most of the watershed is privately owned and a lot of it is managed by and owned by Mosaic and uh, their data was not available to us. Uh, so we relied on, so if we had access to their data, we would have had better information, for example, on karst formations, but we were somewhat limited. I'm just going to point out this line right here. And this is the dividing line where below this line, we have the coastal Douglas fir ecosystems. And above this line, the watershed is uh, occupied by the coastal Western hemlock ecosystems. So that's uh, a very quick uh, wrap up of what the original character of the watershed was. And now I'd like to talk about its current condition. This is a photograph uh, taken by Bernie and it was, I think that was, yeah, that was January and it was the big storm we had. And uh, the Coxila, of course, was definitely was a very flashy day that day. The water level rose extremely dramatically. And as you can see, it also uh, picked up a lot of silt from the tributaries that were pouring into the system. So what happened 160 years ago, the first ship arrives, the settlers arrive and they start building communities. Uh, to build those communities, trees are cut down and industries begin uh, in terms of logging, farming to feed the people, dairy industry developed and became another local source of income for people. In order for these communities to thrive, <clears throat> water extraction began. And we'll see later in a photograph, but development in the estuary over time became very intensive as well. And you will see in photographs, uh, areas being filled in for use for industry and for agriculture. Roads were being built over time and recreation use increased. So these are just some of the ways that the settler communities were influencing the watershed when they moved in. This picture here is actually from the Coxila. Uh, you can see a person here and somewhere in here, I've, oh, here it is, here is his ax. So it looks very, like a very ambitious endeavor he's attempting here. So in this picture, just to remind you, here is our line where we have coastal Douglas fir on this side, coastal Western hemlock on this side. And what this map is showing us is that within the coastal Douglas fir, that very rare ecosystem that Guy was just pointing out to us, it is primarily occupied by agriculture. So this is where the people live. And this is where the land is cleared for you know, a variety of farming endeavors from dairy farms, uh, hay crops and uh, several vineyards as well. So about 80% of the watershed is forestry, 15% of it is agriculture, and then there's several other minor uses. Now this psychedelic map shows us the different types of forest operators within the watershed. And these really bright pink colors, uh, the, that is the land that Mosaic is responsible for managing. I would just like to point out there's this brown color and then this pinkish color. Those are the those pockets of crown land, provincial crown land within the watershed. Only about 8% of the watershed is crown land and the rest of it is private land. So. And then we have this brighter green, which is just smaller parcels as well of private managed forest.
So just a couple of photographs from the air, uh, having a sneak peek at what this watershed was like and, and remembering its original character full of these old forests with big trees, little trees, a lot of diversity, a lot of structure. And you can see in this lower river valley here, remnants of the old forest that used to be here. And just compare that with the adjacent younger forests over here. And you can see how there's, you just don't see that same diversity. It's much more homogeneous in terms of structure. So a very, very different look than these forests here. Invasive plants are, uh, they're a problem everywhere, but they're certainly a problem in the Coxsila watershed. Uh, you can see the broom that is growing along the power line. And, and if you look really closely, you can see how it's spreading all the way up and down the water or down through the cut blocks as well. So broom is a very significant problem. This picture here just shows two examples of riparian buffers in the forest uh, forestry areas. Here's a the very narrow riparian buffer on a small stream. And here we can see another very narrow riparian buffer around one of the more significant wetland complexes within the watershed. And thinking about animals like amphibians who uh, as part of their life cycle, they need to migrate several hundred meters, even, even in some cases up to kilometers to get to their uh, other habitat that they need for different life processes you can see how it would be very hard for little frogs to get across some of these wide open areas and clear cuts without getting a little too warm on a hot summer day. So these riparian buffers are, are quite small and insignificant if you're an amphibian especially. Just uh, one snapshot of the very low areas of the watershed. Here's where we have the Coxsila entering the Cowichan River. Here it is creeping in. Um, most of this picture is actually, uh, or this area is outside of the watershed, but I, I just wanted to include this because it provides a good bird's eye view of the estuary and the areas filled in for agriculture and for industry. It's a very heavily impacted estuary as part of the Coxsila system. <clears throat> This map I find extremely interesting. I know I was very surprised the first time I saw it. And, and what it is, is we had um, uh, air photo type of analysis or an imagery type of analysis, looking at where all the roads are within the watershed. And overall, you can see they are fairly homogeneously spread from the very bottom of the watershed all the way to the very top. And what, what we was determined as part of this analysis is that within the watershed, there's 1,410 kilometers of road. And if you think of a square kilometer of ground, there is on average 4.5 kilometers of road within that square kilometer of land. And so is that a big deal or not? Well, that's actually a very significant number. And some of the provincial data that, or provincial uh, guidelines that we looked at suggest that road density should be kept below about 1.3 kilometers of road per kilometers, a square kilometer of ground. So road density within the Coxsila is extremely high. Now this is a, a really interesting picture and normally I would be showing you six pictures, but due to time constraints, I'm just gonna show you three of them. So I'm just going to point out, don't get lost in the detail here. I just wanna point out a few things. So this is a picture of what the watershed looked like in 1954. And what it shows is this dark green area, which is the original forest. This lighter green is areas that were logged before 1940. The white is land that was cleared. And then the red is old growth forests that were logged between 1940 and 1954. But what I found really interesting about this is you can already see, you know, this doesn't have that coastal Douglas fir line on it, but it runs roughly along here. 
You can see that already by 1954, old forests were nearly absent from the coastal Douglas forest ecosystem type and significantly reduced already by in, within the coastal western hemlock. And uh, one of the interesting things, it, there's different authors that have calculated this different ways. So I, I'm going to speak generally now, but if you wanna protect the ecological integrity of a piece of land, if you wanna make sure there's enough of the structures there such that it can function properly and be a healthy watershed, the general expectation is you want about 50% of that watershed in old forest. So you can look at this map and see that already by 1954, this watershed was probably uh, already at that point a little low on old forest in terms of keeping it healthy. Here we are in 1985, and I just wanted to include this map to show you, whoops, where did that happen? To show you that uh, there's a vast reduction of old forest. Now we're down to only 15%. And it's the beginning of what we call the second pass of logging. So the watershed was logged once, forest grew back, and now it's being logged a second time. And this was our final map in the series of six, and it points out a number of things. It shows that within the coastal Douglas fir, there is still some land clearing occurring. It also shows that there's rather, you know, I find this to be quite unfortunate. There had been old forest around this wetland, and uh, in recent years, it was all cut down. And uh, it shows that really the healthiest part of the whole watershed in terms of having some old forest is our Grant Lake watershed, the dark green being our original forest and the lighter green being 80 year old forest. So this is probably our best piece in terms of ecological health. We did a very, very brief and preliminary uh, analysis of some of the publicly available water data as part of this project. And I just have one slide to summarize some of the key points. And, you know, Coxila really suffers from low flows in the summer. It, it makes the news uh, almost every year, it seems lately, uh, in terms of water shortages that were resulting in the agriculture community and even homeowners unable to uh, access water for irrigation. And so looking at that water data, uh, one of the questions was what is contributing to these low summer flows? And certainly climate change is one thing that is uh, affecting water and as most likely is only going to get worse as we continue on into the future. Uh, a real concern within the watershed is that the demand for water, of course, and this is for agriculture is greatest when there's the least water there. So that's a very big problem that needs to be dealt with. But land, this one is what I wanted to highlight for you that land use in general is very much affecting the summer flows. And not only is it the water withdrawals, but that incredible road density we were just looking at and the very intensive forest management practices that were have been practiced uh, over the last 160 years. Just a, a quick look at fish uh, habitat. And I'm just going to point out, uh, this is one way of looking at quality of fish habitat and it's where are the streams the most gentle in terms of gradient. It's the easier place for the fish to swim. And essentially the lighter the blue color within this map, the higher value the fish stream is, or the fish habitat is. And in this case, you can see once again, that most of the highest value fish habitat is within the coastal Douglas fir. And this is where agriculture is and a tremendous amount of, of land clearing. So this whole ecosystem here is under a lot of stress. Uh, funny as things go, uh, we had just barely finished report number one, which was talking about wildlife and 
and the federal critical habitat that had been established. And when we did the report, there were only three species that had critical habitat. And a week later, there were six. So I'm not going to go into detail here, just to make the point that wherever it's yellow, this is an area where the federal government has said, you know, there's some there's a special kind of species here and you know you need to take some extra steps to make sure that that habitat for that species is managed and maintained. So what we're seeing here is that most of the coxyla is of concern in terms of wildlife habitat. In a nutshell, the, the problems that have been occurring within the coxyla watershed, it's, its current condition, uh, it's serious problem with low flows in the summer, serious problem with winter flooding and communities going underwater or homes going underwater. Water quality is declining in certain areas, uh, some, in some cases with sediment, other cases with respect to um, coliforms and problems with <clears throat> Uh, with the, uh, in terms of cattle and people's failing septic fields. Fish populations have plummeted in the last, well, especially since 1990. We've had a tremendous loss of wildlife habitat, that loss of structure, and a lot of invasive species moving in. So the Coxyla watershed is definitely suffering. So that's the end of the sad story. Now we have to turn the table and decide, okay, what are we going to do to try and, and solve these issues? And so that's where Emily and I put our heads together to come up with this protected landscape network to guide community conversations about, okay, what can we do to start turning things around and improving the health of our watershed? So looking at what we know, uh, what we learned is that if we wanted to protect water, which of course includes fish habitat, then the things in the landscape we want to protect include streams and creeks and springs, those wetlands and lakes so important for water storage, those karst formations that protect and provide the cold water into the system, and those very vulnerable aquifers. And the other thing we need to do is increase the amount of mature and old forest types we have within the watershed. In terms of wildlife, we want to protect many of the same things as we saw on the previous slide. And it, in addition to that, we want to protect critical habitat and then unique features in the landscape like rock bluffs or in the meadows. And for climate change, now this is a found a great paper that has, was a review of over 200 papers on what you can do with respect to reducing risk from climate change. Uh, lots of recommendations. These are just a few that were most relevant to our project. Uh, same points as before, protecting the karst and the various water features is very important. But in addition, we want to start to create connectivity. We want to create all parts of the watershed across the slopes, up and down the slopes. There is a goal to create big and little reserves and to create lots of reserves and have them close together. And then of course, to reduce stressors, uh, reduce those road density if possible and perhaps move to a more gentle type of forestry. So I, I just as an afterthought through in this map, I didn't want to actually talk about it, but as I was going through, I realized this one actually says a lot. I found, I find it some, um, uh, you know, that this was part of our building block process, putting all the map layers together to start to form our, our network. But what this map really shows, especially clearly, is the whole lack of old forest within the watershed. And to think that 160 years ago, probably 80% of this map would have been dark green. And now it's only 1% of the watershed is old and original forest. So it really impressed upon me when I saw this particular map. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we got to do something. We have to do something very different and very soon. So this is the network that Emily and I came up with. 
Uh, so the yellow areas, and you can see some uh, little orange bits and the green bits, these are all parts added together that create that protected landscape network, where if practiced as intended, it would mean activities like forestry or agriculture or any type of human use would not occur within those areas. <clears throat> So here are some of the things that we captured within that network. Any of the streams, wetlands, or lakes are covered up. And we added a 50 meter riparian buffer to all the water bodies. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Any of those karst areas were protected, those very vulnerable aquifers, those bits of steep terrain, some of the more important wildlife habitat, those few little pieces of old forest and some of those unique features and ecosystems, those rocky outcrops and any parks that exist within the watershed. Now that created nice blobs all over the place, but then we had to start joining things. And so what we had to use to join those, we decided after a lot of talking about different approaches was, well, let's protect Let's just see how, what luck we can have using whatever is the oldest forest at the current time to start joining all those other pieces together. And, and I have older in quotation marks there because in order to create any connectivity within the watershed, we had to describe a old enough forest as being 40 years old. So still quite young. We tried 80 and it just didn't work. So I included this one because I love the story that this map tells. Here is the Coxila watershed that we were just looking at in the previous slide. But notice it's right adjacent to Seanigan Lake and you can see it as well has the same coloring, the greens and the yellows because this is the protected landscape network that was created for the Seanigan Lake watershed. So we made sure that we joined up with it so that we're starting to create this idea of connectivity between the two watersheds. And then wouldn't it be nice if we continued on on the upper part of the screen. So now I'd like to talk about the parts that aren't yellow or orange or green. Does this mean it's just business as usual in this planning style? Can we just do whatever we want within those areas that have not been colored? And of course, the answer is no. Now we're starting to look at the protected ecosystem network. Now, in the previous slide, all those bits we covered as part of the protected landscape network, they added up to 42% of the watershed. So we hope to capture the remaining 8%, just thinking 50% would be a good amount to protect if, because as according to literature, that's what we want to do in order to uh, maintain or to create some ecosystem health. Here's where we can capture the remaining 8%. And this is where people and landowners really need to chip in. And so the idea with the protected ecosystem networks, which are in those non-colored bits, is to look for those features that are missed. So now we're on the ground. We're no longer using maps and doing a an overview type of assessment. Now we have our boots on and we're walking around our property or walking around our neighborhood and we're looking, well, what, what are the features that were missed? Do I have any small streams on my property? Are there any old trees here or rare trees like the, um, the Gary Oak? And are there any interesting wildlife features like wallows that the elk like to roll in? So we're looking for small scale connectivity. Where's that nice little band of trees that would really benefit from being kept? And it also is the stage where we also, where we refine that protected landscape network because of course it's not perfect. It's not been ground truth. And some of the information would just be plain wrong when we developed it. So this is the opportunity to, to refine the, uh, <clears throat> the, the protected landscape network. I'm not going over this table, but I just want to highlight it because it's in the report and it might be of some interest to you on your own at some point because it includes various things that can be done within 
the protected ecosystem network to help us get to that 50%. And how we've broken it out are, you know, if you're living in the agriculture zone, here are some things you can do. If you're working in the forestry part, here are some things you can do. If you live in the community or in, in the rural residential, for example, here's some things you can do. So, and I'm just going to go over a couple of these, some of my favorites. And of course, what's always going to be my favorite is it's really important, whether you're working in forestry, whether you're a developer establishing a new subdivision, um, anybody, look for those small water features and ensure they're protected all those small streams and features. But how much protection do they require? I mentioned earlier the 50 meters and I did a, just a, a little bit of research here and I came across um, a bunch of papers that are recommending different riparian buffer widths. And so within all these papers I looked at, for example, for bank stabilization, whoops, the daisies, The full range of um, uh, riparian buffers that was recommended was 10 to 30 meters. And then for each category, I also listed a common range. This is what most people said. This was the whole range of what different authors said. And here's what most of them said. So in the case for the bank stabilization, it's the same. But for other ones, like for controlling sediment, there was a very wide range from five meters to 100 where there seemed to be a fair amount of consensus that if you save between 10 and 30 meters, you're going to be doing okay. Now, of course, take these all with a grain of salt because they're gonna vary tremendously with your site, uh, depending on your soils and slopes. But some of the, you know, and, and most of them are fairly small, but I just wanna point out the significant ones. If you're concerned about flooding, you need a big riparian buffer. And they're so important for slowing down and capturing the energy out of the water. And if you're especially concerned about wildlife, again, here's where we start to look at some of the bigger buffers. And even though they're small, those little amphibians are the ones that need very significant buffers. So an another thing that's very important as we're moving into the future and as we're wanting to build that connectivity, even within the areas where we are developing, uh, we want to, wherever we are, to make sure we're protecting any old trees that we find and any old forests. There's so few, uh, they, they should not be cut. And this is a favorite idea of mine, these full cycle trees. And, and whether you're talking forestry, and I think you can even use this concept if you're designing a new subdivision, like some of those examples that Guy was showing where you cluster your houses, that allows you to have areas forested that are far away from the houses that you can add this idea of full cycle trees. And these are the trees that you leave to just do their own thing. You leave them to live out their life cycles, grow big, stand there being dead, fall over. You don't harvest them for firewood. You don't uh, pull them out of the way once they hit the ground. You just leave them to, do, to uh, play all their roles in ending with contributing to healthy soils. Uh, leave large dead trees, all that dead wood, we need to start creating more dead wood within our landscape. Where it's suitable, you know, we've logged an awful lot of the cedar in the past that needs to be replaced. And I always love to mention white pine, not only is it a species that used to be here, uh, but was lost because of an introduced disease, it's also extremely um, adaptable and resilient. I think it's going to be a good species to help us deal with climate change. And just restoring the land in general, you know, we've got to get away from this clear cutting and land clearing. Enough of it has happened. We need to move away from that and start doing something more gentle with the land. And all those roads, they need to be reduced drastically in amount. We need to establish natural drainage. And that's also going to help 
reduce the flashiness of the systems and keep some of the sediment out of the streams as well. In closing, uh, this Silva Forest Foundation who developed the methodology that uh, Emily and I based our work on, they, they have nine or eight principles uh, that, that guide their work and they're all very, very important, but there's no way I'm gonna go through them because you won't remember them that way. And so I just want you to remember one. And, and the, this is my favorite principle and it's the one that I keep in my mind, whether I'm working at the landscape level, um, <clears throat> uh, working on my own property. And I think it's something that no matter if you're working in forestry, agriculture, um, building your new house on your new property, it's the one thing to remember. And whenever you look at a piece of land, take a look first at what needs to be protected. What are the values here that we want to see carry on into the future? And then decide what part of that property you can use. So just a bit of a shift in our thinking. And that's it. So there we go, Heather, thank you so much. That's, um, wow, loads of food for thought. So um, I'm gonna suggest that you put questions in the chat box and then Nikki will monitor the chat box if that's okay. And if you invite you to actually unmute yourself and ask your question. So I'll, I'll, I'll get things going while you're getting your brains thinking. I was off on the, down at um, Couch and Bay about six weeks ago, just after the real large amount of, of rain we had. And the entire sea there was just thick brown. And I asked the local boat, I said, yeah, it, it, it happens after heavy rains and we just move out for a while. Is that thick brown coming from the Cowichan River up by Cowichan Lake, or is it coming from the Coxsila watershed, the sort of erosion of, of soil off the land? Do you, do you know, Heather? Well, I, I, I certainly have my opinion. Now, how accurate it is, I'm not sure. Uh, I live on the Cowichan River, so I watch it regularly and see what the sediment does. And in fact, I live just downstream of Stoltz Bluffs, which is a major source of sediment within the Cowichan system. And the day that Barry took that photograph, uh, or Bernie, pardon me, took that photograph of the very muddy river in, or water in the Coxsila, that was that really, really rainy day. So we were there in the Coxsila doing a hike of the ancient forest and there's that muddy, muddy, muddy water. And then I come home and I look at the Cowichan River and it's a little bit dirty, but it is nothing at all. It's absolutely not comparable to the Coxsila at all. So I would expect most of it is coming from the Coxsila. I rarely, if I don't know if I've ever seen the Cowichan the same color as, as what you saw in that other photograph. So, yeah. Yeah, I was shocked. I'd, I'd never seen the, the whole sea totally brown all throughout the whole harbor here. Yeah. So no, <laughs> Mate has got a question, if you could explain the importance of cast landscapes and that function in the landscape. Sure, yeah, I kind of jumped over that one a little quickly. So, so I don't know how familiar you are with, with karst, and it certainly does exist within the Coxsila. It's something that people who go caving or get really excited about. And it's those limestone formations, and when you get underground water, it just very, you know, in a geographic, logical perspective, it very rapidly uh, erodes away a lot of that rock and creates, a, again, this very um, interesting underground network of, of caves and streams. And so there's a number of things that make that valuable. As I mentioned briefly, uh, the water is staying underground, so it's staying nice and cold. And that cold water is really important as it enters into above ground and enters into the main stream, it's very important at bringing that main stream temperature down to keep the fish habitat healthy. That is one of the bigger problems with fish habitat in the summer, the water gets too warm. So that helps to cool it down. Those caves can also have, um, because of the different uh, substrate the water is traveling through, it can pick up a lot of different minerals so just changing the mineral content to something that's more 
healthy. Um, it can provide great wildlife habitat. You'll find bats in these caves and formations. So it's also important for wildlife. And in fact, when I worked for the provincial government, we were creating what was called a wildlife habitat area that protected a karst formation from forest operations because of a little um, arthropod, a little teeny microscopic little critter that was living within the, uh, within the cave. So they can um, be habitat for just those really odd wildlife species and even plant communities that you just don't find anywhere else. So those are some of the reasons why karst is important. Okay, so while people are sort of getting their questions lined up, I have the, the big question, which I know is on everyone's mind, because given that the majority of the land is under the management of mosaic in the private managed forest land. And last year, the government did a review. They asked for our input into how we would change that. And a lot of local municipalities was got together in quite a coherent response that said, we need to have a say on our watershed management as a minimum. Mm -hmm. Do you know when the government's going to bring out the report on the private managed forest land and what hope do you have that it might lead to some useful changes? <laughs> oh, one of those questions. Uh, I have no idea on timing. Um, you know, I hate to sound pessimistic, but my expectations are not high <laughs> in terms of what its actual content will be. Um, Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, where, how often do you ever see radical change for the good? I mean, we're looking at this whole old growth issue right now and, and this incredibly strong report written for old growth and, and we're still seeing people having to go protest as we were yeah. talking about earlier. Um, and that, that's a more, um, something that the general public can can engage in more easily it's a much more emotional issue and we're still not seeing change so so i'm not super optimistic but at the same time till i take my last breath in life you know i know personally i will continue on the path of well what can we change and my personal goal is to see things improve in terms of riparian protection that is my, you know, if we're only going to protect one thing or if we can only make one baby step, that's the baby step I want to see. And then my children and grandchildren can take the next steps. So, so in terms of, um, obviously, we know the government, and we've got more hope with an NDP government than with a Liberal government. We may not be very hopeful, but it's something. Um, would you be hoping that there could be a bit of legislation actually calling for an increase in the uh, there's riparian zone protected area under the riparian areas regulation? Uh, for like the small private, are you just talking about the small private? Well, well I don't, I don't, I don't know. Ground. You know, you know more about the act than I do. I mean, okay. if we were to sort of have a clear ask of the government, and nothing happens unless you've got a clear ask. And let's imagine we can get 30 organizations all together up the east coast of the island together asking for a single piece of change or maybe six pieces but this will be one of them what would it be oh riparian protection for sure i mean when you look at what is required on the private managed forest land for example where mosaic operates it's peanuts it's it's very thin um it's a, a small number of meters. It's, you know, it, it's insignificant as far as I, I can tell. Yeah. So I, so I know in the couch and in the south part of the couch and alley, there's a lot of groups working on this kind of stuff. Up in the north, there's, there's almost us and very few others. But do your groups get together to actually say, this is what we need to lobby the government for and hold a meeting with George Heyman and with his staff to specifically ask for this kind of change? Well, you know, here's where I should let either um, Roger or Allison speak up as well. They're, I see they're here and they've been active longer than I have and on the board. I mean, whenever there's an issue, of course, we'll provide letters to the government, but I don't think, you know, I, I can be corrected here, but I can't recall any time that the Coxsila Working Group has actively lobbied along with other groups and, and tried to create another movement. So far, the focus has been on 
you know, you have to look back to what this whole project was. It started off as, well, let's find out what our watershed is like. What are we going to be concerned about? So, you know, this, this work is still relatively new and the group really hasn't um, organized to figure out the next steps yet and the next approaches. There's certainly a lot of hardworking and ambitious and uh, great people within the group. There certainly is capacity to for these next steps. Yeah. So just some, um, Sharon was asking if the, this is being recorded, it will be available as a video afterwards. Um, Carrie Robinson's asking, what are the qualifications that determine a riparian zone? <laughs> That's actually a really good question because, I mean, I gave you a table that has numbers in it. And I never, when I'm working in the forest, I never select my riparian protection zone based on a number. You know, it's just numbers are easier to put into legislation. So, so because a riparian area, it's just, a, you know, of course, it's along some sort of a water body, but it's just a little bit different than anywhere else in some way. The soils are more moist because of the influence of the water. So you're often going to see different plants uh, within that zone and different types of soils. And um, you know, often the trees are bigger, therefore you're getting larger structures. But you know, in a forest operational situation, if, if I am laying out my riparian reserve zone, I don't believe in riparian management zones where you can take out some trees, it's always just a reserve. I establish it primarily on what I'm seeing in the vegetation and in the soils, because there's just things about them that are going to be different than the rest of the area. And of course, slopes. You know, sometimes it's a very obvious where the slope suddenly changes. And with that change, again, your soils and plants are going to change. Yeah. So as we know that the, the global biodiversity goals are calling for 30% of all land to be protected by 2030 and 50, you know, some say 50% by 2050. Um, I would have thought this decade, a lot of us feel it's the critical decade, both for the climate emergency and for the biodiversity emergency. And if all the groups were to get together on the east coast of the island, all the groups to do with conservation and creek, protect, creek protection and forest protection, to, to, we could be a stronger lobby for that if we knew very clearly what exactly it is we're asking for. I mean, expanded riparian zones would be one of them. Um, restoring all the logging roads on, on mosaic lands might be another one. There could be a list of those things. And then we could put, a, put them into one package and really go to town saying, we need to do this and get, you know, 5,000 people behind it, because we, we, we command this kind of numbers between all our groups put together. We have that kind of number if we organize together. Well, you know, and I always love the, you know, the Forest Practices Code era had some really good ideas in it too. And, and one of the things that we've moved away from is this idea of landscape unit planning. You take a, say the watershed, and you create a plan within it that's that's not based on administrative boundaries so much, but it's based on ecology. You know, sort of how we, you know, came up with a plan for Coxsila adjacent to Shawnigan and we made them make sense to each other. So, so these are all different types of strategies that need to happen. Bruce, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question about carbon credits and mosaic? Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, um, I I know that uh, Mosaic is going to be presenting to the Stewardship Roundtable in two weeks. That's the third Thursday of this month. I, I believe that's the date in the morning. Anyway, um, uh, I was wondering if you know anything. If, are there any bits of that Strathcona Carbon Credit Plan there, there Strathcona, that fall within the watershed and and sort of how big are the bits? <laughs> Is it like 1% or 0.1% or, or, or less? <laughs> so, well, you Does know, it have any it, significance whatsoever. I, I have to tell you a funny story there because now I'm going to switch over for a moment and talk about the land trust project where I was just working on that, that you were there where I presented on, on Monday. And, and so I was researching carbon and researching what mosaic was doing. And, you know, you Google it and I came up with a news article and it quoted Domenico, their chief forester, and it talked about how the Coxsila ancient forest 
was um, part of the um, their carbon uh, protect their carbon project. It was protected. And uh, so I wrote my little paragraph and then I emailed it off to them saying, you know, this is what I'm putting in my report. Is it right? And the response I got was um, nah, kind of change it a little bit. You know, we're not referring to specific pieces of land. So the piece of land may change. So uh, the way it is right now is there's the opportunity that, you know, this year, this part is protected, um, but in, that doesn't mean that that piece of land is going to be protected, you know, 10 years from now. So, so it can move. It, what, what they're saying is that within a 24,000 hectare area, they will protect 1,000 hectares. So, but it can move. Hmm. And so, also, I think, isn't there a limit on the date of 25 years or something like that? Yes. That they're and committing to. Right now, but I, you know, what I also understand, and this is from talking to them a few weeks ago, is that it's all being redone and restructured. Their whole carbon credit system is going to be changing. I'm very curious. I'm very interested in what's going, what we're going to learn at the roundtable. Um, they're having to move to something apparently that's more spatial. So they're having to put some lines on the map rather than having it this vague way where things can move around so so yes i think that presentation will be one to to uh, attend so roger hunter is throwing in the thought that it sounds like a carousel of carbon credits and <laughs> a carbon credits it, it can be a very dangerous path because your companies are going to use them to to justify the continued release of emissions from oil and gas and coal and you've got to be able to guarantee that that forest is going to be there in 100 years time so Really, a car, if, a car, if a forest is set aside for carbon credits, should it not have a provincial regulation around it saying, you know, any logging is banned for 100 years on that land? Yeah, well, you know, in some cases, um, carbon is being used to per protect land permanently. And there's cases on Quadra Island where um, uh, land was turned, you know, through the carbon process, the piece of land in, of interest was turned into a provincial park. And then we also have the movement in the, it's in the West Kootenays and it is, could be 30,000 hectares. It's way more than 10,000 hectares, but it's another piece of land. It was an operational forest, private land. And it was managed fairly well though. And now it's in, I think it's the Nature Conservancy who bought that one, Darkwoods. And oh, dark. they're slowly transitioning, you know, they're building carbon credits. They're sort of slowing their forestry down so they're building their carbon credits up and their ultimate goal is to move to permanent protection. Yeah. So it can be used for permanent. Yeah. I'd like to invite um, Genevieve Zinkleton to sort of unmute yourself and you've got some thoughts on the role of the couch and stewardship round table in this discussion. Do you want to just take a minute and give us your thoughts, Genevieve? She suddenly vanished. <laughs> she was. She heard her name called and she left. <laughs> Dave Haley, you've got a couple of points you want to share. So why don't you unmute yourself, Dave? Genevieve is there. She she's not in the list anymore. She was. Oh, yes, yes, Genevieve. There you are. She's ready. Genevieve, off you go. Yeah. It looks to be like I'm beside you guys. <laughs> there you are. You're right, um, Genevieve. A great presentation, Heather. As always, I just wanted to let folks know if you're interested to hearing uh, what Mosaic has to say. Um, you can email me the information's over there in the chat line and uh, the round table and the Coke Island working group and many others, and many of them are on this call, are all working hard to find a way to work together for it. Um, and of course, uh, in recognition of uh, couch and tribes as well. Thank you. And don't go away, Genevieve, because I see you've got Dave Singleton lurking in the background there who knows more about ecological restoration than all of us put together. Dave, do you want to sort of take Genevieve's chair and say, if you had a million dollars, what could you do in the Cox Island watershed for restoration? <laughs> you heard <that>? Yeah. <laughs> so I think the, uh, the key issue is to restore the roads and think about the natural processes of 
recovery, um, because say for instance, up at the Quintum Mine, I showed that you could uh, plant alder and conifers together and get better growth of the conifers than they were getting in the cut blocks adjacent to the site, QED. Cool. So let's, uh, let's stop the spraying, um, which doesn't, doesn't uh, do anybody any good and, uh, and um, use the natural processes that have evolved over millions of years to provide the most effective um, recovery of drastically disturbed sites. Yeah. Um, so for instance, uh, when I restored the Johnson's Landing landslide, um, I convinced them not to seed it to grasses and legumes because that would preclude the recovery of that landslide. Now it's covered by balsam poplar trees, which is perfect. So, yeah, you know. I, I'm not being hypothetical here. During the Green Deal in the 19, the New Deal in the 1930s, um, President Roosevelt set up the Conservation Corps, and had, you know thousands of people were out there restoring land. So, if it's part of a Green New Deal in the 19 in the 2020s. We had a youth conservation call, you know, where you got access, you know, thousand young people to be trained in the principles of ecological restoration and get out on the land and do some of the stuff that you you you'll be leading. Possible? We've got to think big. <laughs> oh yeah, it's very possible. That's a great idea. Uh, Dave, for a long time back in the forest uh, or whatever they were called, practice days or something, was involved with deactivating hundreds of miles of logging roads, right? And now there's not the same attention. I saw there was a question to that on the side there. But um, if all those roads that weren't being used, and Heather, that was the biggest new piece of information to me tonight was that map with all the roads that absolutely, uh, it was very, very distressing. Um, but if those are made rough and loose by just bouncing an excavator over, Dave's, Dave's work has shown, as he just mentioned, those would all fill in naturally. You wouldn't have to be doing planting. You just mm -hmm. gotta make them really loose so they're decompacted. And if just that was done, that would be a major step forward. And Dave's got lots of examples that are, you know, scientific and, and proven that this this has happened. Yeah. Thank Heather, you. Any, 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 any response? When, when I restored the Heber Dam, which is just west of Campbell River, um, we made it rough and loose. We scattered some woody debris and we didn't do any planting. Now it's covered by red alder and conifers in 98% of the plots. So Heather, any response? No, it all sounds great to me. Okay, let's go to um, Dave Haley. Do you want to unmute yourself and, and share your thoughts, Dave? Yeah, thanks Guy and, and Heather, I joined late so I only caught your last slide. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that. I had a, a previous conflict. Um, Why don't you introduce yourself? Because you are managing a forest actively yourself, and just tell people what you're up to. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm a professional forester. I am managing my own private land. Um, I'm volunteering with Coastal Douglas for Conservation Partnership. Um, I think I probably know one of the people that that did the Shawnee and Coke Silas study, Tom Bradley. Um, but Guy, you, you asked, you see, you sort of asked, well, what is the ask of government? And, and I have two specific questions or specific suggestions. Um, I think the first one is that the government should, uh, amend the private managed forest land act so that carbon is, uh, considered a legitimate goal. And the second is, uh, I think that between government, between provincial government and local governments, uh, there needs to be a lot more work on um, enabling tools that could be used on, on other private lands. Um, I know that, you know, whether the, the regs for the PFMLA are, are good, bad or indifferent, they exist. And to the best of my knowledge, not much else exists on other lands within local government jurisdiction. And, you know, there's things like the, the Islands Trust has a, a natural area protection tax incentive program. 
that the equivalent doesn't does not exist for other local governments. And it was presented to the past government, but got absolutely no traction. So it seems to me that if there was tools like that, uh, that would uh, enable a, a significant amount of private money to come into restoration activities. Mm. Thanks, Dave. Um, we've got 10 minutes left. I want to turn to Alison. If you can unmute yourself. Alison is responsible for setting this thing up, saying let's share our knowledge. And, but Alison, as a regional director, um, knowing that the CVRD is developing a completely new OCP, the modernized OCP, and inviting us to have input into that, how do we tie together your role as a regional director with the development of an OCP with everything that Heather's telling us? Um... And with what you need, you're trying to do with the coastal Douglas fir, yes, um, yeah, uh, that that was why I thought we should have this meeting because I think we we need to work together on that. Um, you know, as a as a as a director, I really I don't have much. Um, I'm just one of nine people, and I don't. I, I'm probably I'm I know I'm the probably probably the greenest person there. There isn't much. Uh, understanding of both ecological stuff on the on the uh, on the board table, which concerns me greatly because I think so many of our issues have to do with the environment now. So um, yeah, I just think the more the community can work together and and send a solid, uh, convincing voice to the to the board and to staff, um, the farther we it's e the easier it is to push things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the funny thing that you learn when you become a, um, a director is that you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Only staff know things. <laughs> so, so Coralie Breen, who's the CVRD planner responsible for the modernized OCP, is inviting all of us to hold community circles, which could be within the Couch and Stewardship Group or the Cox Island Working Group or whatever. And we can choose any topic for our community circle to get input into the OCP. But if we don't do that and, and start developing language ourselves, the planners will do it for us and then we'll be complaining. So this is a very big opportunity this year. And I'm wondering if you know, Alison and Heather, to what extent are groups in the southern part of the CBRD aware of this opportunity to have an input into the OCP? So, so Guy, I do know the answer to that. Their, um, Coralie is relying on you to test it. So you, you are the big test case. You're the one that's going first and is, and you're going to pave the way for the rest of us. They haven't really advertised it very far yet, but they certainly will when they have a feel whether it's going to work or not. So it's all up to you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, any other questions from people in the last five minutes we have here? Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question without needing to put it in chat. Yeah, uh, uh, Guy. Yes, Dave. Um, yeah, question for Allison. Um, are there any specific sort of legal questions that you're seeing arise out of this uh, uh, redoing of the harmonized OCP? The the modernized is the phrase you want. Modernized, pardon yeah. me. Allison, you go first. That that I that I see. Um, yeah, for, for example, I, 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 you know, does, I, I've heard too, I, I expressed the opinion that, that local governments couldn't put a tax, conservation tax incentive program in place. But I've also heard other opinions that they could, they could use their taxation powers to um, encourage landowners to do more riparian protection. Um, uh, um, you know, what about setting up uh, amenity Density, amenity bonus density issues. So, sort of yeah, so, so Dave, I think a lot of those things apply to municipalities and not to electoral areas. So regional districts, the land use that regional districts does is are the electoral areas and they're the more rural areas, which are largely in my, in my area, it's largely managed forest land or it's um, ALR. So there isn't, so, so yes, we can do amenity stuff, um, but we don't do that kind of, we do, don't often do that kind of development that in my area, at least that 
that would make an appreciable difference to anything. The, the biggest issue that I think is that um, we, we can't also, we also can't have a tree cutting bylaw. So that's what's really um, problematic in, in uh, the rural areas. Now the municipalities can do that. They can do the taxation stuff because they do their own taxation. We don't do our own, we, the province taxes for us. So there are a lot of things that the regional district, the tools that the regional district doesn't have. And, and we really need the province to modernize the legislation so regional districts have more tools. Yeah, okay, I, th thanks. I, think, I, think, I think we share a common, common thought on that one, Alison. So I'm going, to, I'm going to wrap up now and ask Heather if you want to have some, some closing words for us all to inspire us and keep us going. Uh, well, I, I just want to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired when I see the number of people that are here this evening. And uh, that's the one thing that over the last seven years, I am just so impressed by how involved people are and what everyone brings to the table and the enthusiasm and the dedication and and that's what's important and that's where where change comes from i look at my days with the community forest there in herrick proctor which you know was the first ones to demonstrate one of herb hammond's ecosystem based assessments and it was really controversial and and it wasn't started by professionals you know it was started by everyday people it was started by a retired nurse uh an ex tree planter a social worker uh a police dispatch person. So it's groups like this, it's groups uh, that seem to be throughout this whole couch and valley that are so powerful at creating change. So I just want everyone to know that you're all part of a solution and, and can do great things. Thank you. So, heart. so I'm like, this is a call to everyone. If you go to the top right hand corner of your screen and click view and click on gallery view and then and share your camera and we're going to do something together so open up your cameras everyone and then go to reactions and you can click on you can send heather some lovely warm energy uh, <laughs> through your <laughs> through your reaction buttons <laughs> that's our way of clapping and saying thank you very much heather for taking the time and sharing this with, and all the work you do so there we go feel it coming your way <laughs> it's wonderful so, Thank you very much. So thanks everyone. I, this has been recorded. It'll be up on YouTube. I'll tell you all where it is so you can share it with your friends um, within a day or two. Thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks so much, Heather. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.